Thank you for that introduction, and I, I generally appreciate one of the best introductions I've ever received, in fact. And uh, now, let's get serious now, because our subject is a very serious subject, so we shouldn't be, be laughing. I was asked to speak by the committee on the subject of science and religion, and this is because I have absolutely no background training or knowledge in science, and only a little bit in religion. But I had spoken on this subject not too long ago in, um, one of the, in Murfreesboro, when they had an intensive program of growth there. And some of the members of the committee felt that this subject was so important that maybe we should bring it to the school. But I have decided to call the subject of my presentations this morning and tomorrow morning, The Transformation of the World. This morning, the title is called The Transformation of the World, Part 1. And tomorrow, it's going to be called The Transformation of the World, Part 2. And I want to begin by talking about the principle of science and religion and how it relates to the transformation of the world. I like to always think of science and religion. I like to think of James Hutton. How many of you know James Hutton, who he was? Okay, he lived in the late 18th century, late 1700s, considered the father of geology, the father of modern geology. He was Scottish, and he would go out in the mountains and rock areas and kind of look at rocks, you know? And he noticed he could see strata of rocks. And then he realized that certain ones had worn away a certain amount. And he calculated how long it takes rocks to, to uh, wear away. And then he looked at how far down they had gone. And he did his math, and he realized that the Earth was likely several million years older than we thought, even billion years or more older. And so he propounded the theory of what's called geologic time, or, or deep time. And he is now today still considered the father of modern geology. However, he was attacked immediately by the church. And the reason was, at that time, the church believed that the earth began in the year 4004 BC, on October 26th <laughs> at 9 a.m. Now you're laughing, but this is actually true. This is what they believed. They had somehow taken the book of Genesis and calculated the, whatever they did, they came out with the exact time at which the earth was created, right down to the minute. And so he was rejected. And this was a very bitter time. And this was in the late 1700s. It was some 250 years earlier, as you all know, that uh, Nicholas Copernicus, you know who he was? He propounded the theory, first in Europe anyway. I mean, obviously the Greeks and others believed that the sun was the center of the universe. But for a long time, the, the, the Roman world believed that the earth was the center of the universe. So he proposed that rather the sun was. They called this a heliocentric view. And of course, he was named a heretic. Later on, Galileo developed his telescopes, and he absolutely proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Copernicus was right. Galileo, of course, as you know, has been called the father of modern physics, the father of modern science, and various other terminologies. But in his lifetime, he only had one thing that he was called, and that was heretic. He was tried for heresy. He was tried for heresy because he proved Copernicus was correct. And at his trial, he made this statement, quote, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. Isn't that a wonderful statement? And it did him no good. He lost, he was under house arrest, and he was forced to recant his belief in, in this. I mean, you force someone to recant a scientific belief, it seems so strange. And yet, this has been much of the history of science and religion, a very great unease, at least for the past four or five hundred years. And uh, we know it even still today. There is great disharmony between science and religion. Now, in 1912, Abdu'l Baha came to the United States. He traveled for 239 days, and he spoke on a number of subjects. He could have chosen anything to speak on out of all of Baha'u'llah's teachings, but he chose to focus on some principles and some teachings. And if you get that book, Promulgation of Universal Peace, you will find that he rarely failed to stress the importance 
of the harmony of science and religion. And if you read what he says about it, you'll find that there's far more to it than we first think. Because to him, the harmony of science and religion is essential to the evolution and development of humanity. It also has to do with the balance of the material and the spiritual in the life of both the individual and society. I'll read you a few things that he said in his talks in the United States in 1912. Quote, if religious beliefs and opinions are found contrary to the standards of science, they are mere superstitions and imaginations. For the antithesis of knowledge is ignorance, and the child of ignorance is superstition. Unquestionably, there must be agreement between true religion and science. If a question be found contrary to reason, faith and belief in it are impossible, and there is no outcome but wavering and vacillation. In another talk, he said, religion and science are intertwined with each other and cannot be separated. There are two wings which humanity must fly. One wing is not enough. Every religion which does not concern itself with science is mere tradition, and that is not the essential. Therefore, science, education, and civilization are most important necessities for the full religious life. This is very interesting. He's a religious teacher, and he says that science is a necessity for the religious life. Not just be in harmony with it, but it's necessity. In another statement, this is a different talk, he says, we may think of science as one wing and religion as the other. A bird needs two wings for flight. One alone would be useless. Any religion that contradicts science or that is opposed to it is only ignorance, for ignorance is the opposite of knowledge. Religion which consists only of rites and ceremonies, of prejudice is not the truth. Let us earnestly endeavor to be the means of uniting religion and science. There are many other quotes. Actually, I have like seven more. But there's one that's interesting to me because it's almost as if it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy what will happen to the world if we were to unite science and religion. He says, when religion, shorn of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas, shows its conformity with science, then will there be a great unifying, cleansing force in the world, which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggles. And then will mankind be united in the power of the love of God. So he's basically saying when science and religion are united, then the world will transform. Now, when I'm reading these quotes, I'm thinking to myself, well, why is it that religion has conflicted with science in the past? If what Aldo is saying is the case. And I can think of at least one or two reasons why, and I'm sure there are more. One of the reasons is that religion gets corrupted. Man-made doctrines infiltrate religion, and there is no true conflict between science and true religion. There's conflict between the man-made doctrines and religion. For example, we mentioned uh, Copernicus and Galileo, and they, they were attacked by the Catholic Church because of the belief the Catholics believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. But there's nothing in the Bible that says this. They got this from Ptolemy. Ptolemy was a Roman, lived in Alexandria in the second century. As far as I know, he did not write the Bible or any of, the, any of these things. But the church had adopted a man-made doctrine. And the adoption of man-made doctrines can lead to the disharmony of science and religion. Another reason why science and religion are in conflict is because religion has a problem with history and language. And I'm not talking now about Islam and the Baha'i faith. I'm talking about the older religions. They have a problem with language and history because their religious scriptures are written in a dead language 
and a culture that's no longer around. And it is very, very difficult to be sure what was really meant. When you translate from one language to another, it's difficult. It's even difficult in our own language to know surely what's going on. If someone were to take the writings of the United States and it was in 1920 or 1940 and they used a certain word in 1920 or 1960, it may be completely different. It is very difficult. Why would we base our entire belief that the earth you know, was created you know, in six days based on an understanding of a dead language? Let me tell you something. I don't even sometimes understand my own children when they come home. They come home and they'll say something, and I don't even know what that word means. And I live in the same country, speak the same language, and I live in the same family, and I can't even understand. And yet they are willing to stake their lives on the understanding of a dead language. So this is obviously a problem which they have. This problem is largely superseded by the newer revelations of Islam, the Bab, and the Baha'i faith, because they're in living languages. But that has been a problem. It's just merely the problem of interpretation of dead languages. And I'm sure there's other reasons why, but we know that true religion does not conflict with science. So I thought about it and I said, well, really, then religion and science are pretty much the same thing. In fact, if you look at it, sometimes religion acts like bad science. And sometimes science, unfortunately, acts more like a bad religion. You'll, you'll find many times science will reject something based on superstition as well. And if you look closely at the history of religion and the history of science, you'll see that there are a number of striking parallels. What are some of those parallels, similarities? The first similarity is rejection. It seems that when religion first arrives, when revelation first occurs, it is normally rejected. And when great scientific discoveries are made, they are usually rejected, and usually rejected by the very scientists that should know better. For example, I was recently reading this interesting uh, story of the five or six year period during which time the Wright brothers were considered fraud. And I say the five or six year period, the five or six year period after they flew at Kitty Hawk. Okay, now, I saw the movie. They flew at Kitty Hawk and the orchestra played and everybody was cheering. But apparently in real life, there was no orchestra at Kitty Hawk and nobody accepted them. And you can see that there's now infamous articles in Scientific American, two, three, four years later, saying how these Wright brothers are total frauds because we all know it's impossible for heavier than air vehicles to fly. It cannot be true because it's impossible. Science acting like bad religion in, in this case. And, and you go back to the history of science and you'll find that rejection is a common feature of both science and religion. It seems that whenever there's advancement, there's rejection. It's also true that both science and religion are prone to arrogance. They're prone to arrogance. They tend to believe that what they have learned and what they've known is it. It's also true that both science and religion tend to believe that they have absolute truth. And in reality, neither science nor religion has absolute truth at no time. We know in the Baha'i faith that Shoghi Fendi said this is one of the fundamental principles of religious revelation, that religious truth is never absolute. It's only relative to the needs of the age. And religion has trouble with this sometimes too, but we as Baha'is know that religious truth is not absolute. It can never be because there's too much truth. But science also tends to believe it has absolute truth. The irony is that today... We know more about the world, more about chemistry, more about physics, more about cosmology, more about all of We know more than we have ever known, and yet we realize how much we don't know. We realize how much we don't know in a more profound way. For example, scientists now believe that we know of about 4% of the universe and 96% of it, we don't know where it is or what it is, but we know it's there, based on Newton's laws of gravity and how much mass needs to be out there. So we're only up to 4%, and yet we think we know so much. So both of them are not absolute, 
but both of them tend to believe they are absolute. Einstein once said that the most important thing in science is always to keep an open mind. I'm going to read you this quote. He says, the most important thing in science is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to contemplate a little bit of this mystery each day, but never lose a holy curiosity. Okay, so there's three things now that seem to be parallel, similar between science and religion. One, rejection when it first comes. Two, uh, they're both prone to arrogance. Three, neither of them are ever absolute. And the fourth is that they both appear to be cyclical. They both appear to not happen regularly, gradually, but rather there's a spurt, and then they live off that spurt for a long time, and then there's a long period in which it decays, and then there's another spurt. They, they go in cycles, like the sun, and the moon, like the seasons, and so on. Both religion and science appear to be cyclical. And we know this, of course, as Baha'is. We understand that religion is cyclical. But the interesting thing is that the three greatest periods in recent history, and when I say recent, I mean the last two and a half, three thousand years. In other words, what we know is, is, is uh, real recorded history. Three of the greatest periods in which science flourished all coincidentally happened soon after the appearance of a manifestation of God. One was in uh, the Greeks' uh, period, uh, great efforts of the science, Pythagoras and so on, and we know that they got this knowledge from the Middle East, from the Jewish religion, from Moses. And Abdu'l-Bahá talks about this in some answered questions. In fact, I studied in music Pythagoras. You know, how many know who Pythagoras is? We thought, I thought he was Greek. Did you think he was Greek? Yeah, that's what they told me, because Pythagoras was the founder of all music theory, so we study him a lot. No, he, he wasn't from mainland Greece. He was from the island of Samos, which is four miles from Asia Minor, the easternmost island in all of Greece. Where did he go to school and university? In Egypt. Okay. Comes back from Egypt with his university education. Even Egyptian priesthood comes back to the island of Samos, and yet we just forget this. And Adabaha says it's the same with many of the other Greek philosophers. They all went to Israel and so on, and they gained their knowledge. And there was a great flourishing of scientific knowledge as far as it could be at that time. Secondly, we find a great scientific growth following the appearance of Muhammad. A tremendous scientific growth. And even Western Europe and the Renaissance, there's not a historian, not even a Western historian, that will not admit that it was the knowledge that came from Islamic civilization, came through Moorish Spain and up. Some of the earliest popes, the ones that were doctors and scientists, you remember those? Early, they all studied in Spain, and they all got their knowledge from Muhammad. And the third period of scientific efflorescence happened mysteriously in the 19th century. And we all know what happened in the 19th century. Uh, Baha'u'llah, the Bab and Baha'u'llah appeared, and science exploded. It absolutely exploded. Now, we may not realize the extent of what was discovered in the 19th century. As you know, in the early part of the century, the late uh, 18th century, they finally figured out some of the workings of magnetism. And magnetism is a great mystery in the world. Okay? And then they finally discovered the principles of electricity, the discovery of the electric circuit, for example, that, that electricity could flow and you could use it as opposed to just static electricity and so on. Then they started working on light, and it was Faraday in the early part of the century, and by the 1860s, 1870s, of course, it was uh, Maxwell. And Maxwell basically united all of these three powers, magnetism, electricity and light, and discovered what we now know as the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum 
was that light is just a little tiny part of this vibrating spectrum. And all this rest we had never seen before the 1860s, 1870s. Well, of course we couldn't see it. Our eyes can only see visual light. How much of the electromagnetic spectrum can we see? Well, scientists tell us that if you take the electromagnetic spectrum and make it a film, or a 35 millimeter film, which each frame is like that, you could stretch the film all the way from Southern California to Alaska. And what we can see is one frame of that film. That's just a little bit south of Seattle, I've been told. Uh, <laughs> before the 1860s or 1870s, that's all we could see. And this much more was discovered. Can you imagine that? And almost every invention that came in the 19th and early 20th centuries was the result or owed its uh, origins to the understanding of electricity and magnetism, which ultimately became one force, electromagnetism and light and all of the other things. And from that then followed the understanding of atoms and the periodic table, you know, Mendeleev formulated the periodic table and then the atom was ultimately defined by Niels Bohr and then Einstein developed his theory of relativity and so on. It is an amazing period of time. Abdu'l-Bahá says that more happened in that century in science than in 100 other centuries. In 100 other centuries. Some of the inventors that built on this were Nicholas Tesla, Lord Kelvin, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, Werner von Siemens, and so on. These people completely transformed our lives. And the life we live today is based on what they were able to take from these scientific discoveries. Now, this leads me to an understanding of the true significance of Rezvan. You know, Rezvan is, the, is when Baha'u'llah, uh, he crossed the river on his way departing from Baghdad, and then spent 12 days, and on the first day he announced his mission as a manifestation of God. We celebrate this every year. We also form our local assemblies and so on. And most of us consider the significance of Rezvan in our celebrations to be to recount the story. We tell how Baha'u'llah went to the garden and the nightingales were there and the roses and the red roan stallion. Is that correct? That's, that's what we think. But if you read what Baha'u'llah and Adabaha said about the true meaning of Rezvan, it's quite different. We have three references that are interesting. We don't know exactly what Baha'u'llah said on that day because the actual declaration was not recorded. But we have three references to it. One is where Mirza Akha Jan, who was his secretary, wrote in response to some questions a list of the points that Baha'u'llah made in the Garden of Rezvan. We have that. We also have a tablet of Baha'u'llah in which he refers to it. And then we also have a letter from Abdu Baha in which someone wrote to Abdu Baha to comment on Rezvan. And I want to read all of those to you. Mirza Akajan, in his answer, when he was describing what Baha'u'llah said in Rezvan, listed that Baha'u'llah made three statements. I'm not going to tell you what the first two are, but here's the third. It says, the third statement on the first day of Rezvan was that the moment he uttered those words, all the names and attributes of God were fully manifested within all created things. By this, he implied the advent of a new day and the infusion of a fresh capacity into all beings. So the meaning of Rezvan is that religious revelation is a dual gift. It's the gift of revelation and the simultaneous infusion of capacity. And this is why we see this principle that science flourishes at the same time as revelation. Baha'u'llah himself in the tablet refers to this same concept that Rezvan was infusion. Speaking about his declaration, he said, the divine springtime is come, O most exalted pen, for the festival of the all-merciful is fast approaching. Bestir thyself and magnify before the entire creation the name of God and celebrate his praise in such wise that all created things may be made new. That all created things may be made new. On that day, 
Baha'u'llah made everything new. 1863, it was not just the gift of revelation, but it was the gift of recreation of the earth. As if God peels a layer of the onion away from the world and we can discover all of these sciences. Abdu'l Baha was written a letter by the believers prior to Rezvan, and they said, Abdu'l Baha, will you please send a message to the Baha'is because we're going to celebrate Rezvan. And he wrote a letter, and I'm going to read that to you because this will tell us very clearly what Abdu'l Baha thought Rezvan was all about. He says, quote, Thou dost wish to celebrate the day of Rezvan with a feast and to have those present on that day engage in reciting tablets with delight and joy. And thou didst request me to send thee a letter to be read on that day. This is my letter. O ye beloved and ye handmaids of the merciful, this is the day when the day star of truth rose over the horizon of life and its glory spread and its brightness shone out with such power that it clove the dense and high-piled clouds and mounted the skies of the world in all its splendor. Hence do ye witness a new stirring throughout all created things. See how in this day the scope of sciences and arts hath widened out, and what wondrous technical advances have been made, and to what a high degree the mind's powers have increased and what stupendous inventions have appeared. This age is indeed as one hundred other ages. Should ye gather the yield of a hundred ages and set that against the accumulated product of our times, the yield of this one era will prove greater than that of a hundred gone before. I'm not going to read anymore, but you got the idea. They asked him to write about Rezvan, and he didn't write back and say, oh, that was when Baha'u'llah went across the river and all the nightingales sang and, and all the believers. He didn't, there's not a mention of that. That's not what his understanding of Rezvan is. His understanding of Rezvan was the infusion of capacity into the world simultaneously with the gift of revelation. That is the true meaning of Rezvan. Now, how many more quotes do I have on that subject? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have so many, but I'm not going to read them. I think, I think we understand that this is a very important spiritual principle. Now, it makes perfect sense if we think what Adabaha said earlier this morning. He said that society cannot advance without science and religion being equally strong like two wings of a bird. So why would it not be that God would give us a new revelation and not also give us the capacity to discover new sciences. It, it, it would make no sense. It would be like giving us one wing of a bird. And we witness, all of us witness, the great infusion, the scientific spirit that came. Not everyone yet recognizes the gift of the other son. So, to summarize, it says, the appearance here of the manifestation of God brings two things. The gift of revelation and the infusion of capacity in the human race and the spirit of scientific discovery. Now, I want to now look at two principles that relate to science that are in the Baha'i faith. Two principles that are so important that they give insight into almost every spiritual concept. And I call these the two great principles of physical creation. The two great principles of physical creation. And this concept is not spelled out precisely in the Baha'i writings, but these two principles are there, and I see them so often in the Baha'i writings that I am going to call it that. And these two principles are, number one, the physical world is not reality. That's the first principle, is that the physical world is not reality. The second principle is that the physical world is a symbolic representation of the spiritual world, which is reality. Okay, let's get those two very clear in our mind and then we'll read some quotations from the writings that uh, explain both. The first principle is that the physical world is not reality. The second is that the physical world is a symbolic representation of the spiritual world. Let's look at this first principle. The physical world is not the real world. 
the world that you are looking at now and the chair that you're touching and everything there that you're touching is not the real world. In fact, this is a concept that lies deep in Hinduism, it lies deep in Islam, it lies deep in Buddhism, the concept that there are two worlds and the, the physical one is not reality. In fact, there's an old statement, it's, it comes from Islam, which is attributed to Muhammad. I have yet to find the reference, but I've heard many Muslims say it, and the statement is, this world is a dream. We awaken upon death. And it's a wonderful concept because every one of us knows the mysterious, strange feeling when you first wake up in the morning and you realize that you are only dreaming. Because while you're in the dream, it seems real while you're in the dream. And then suddenly you say, oh, that was all a dream. And to imagine that Muhammad says that that's how you will see this life upon death is interesting. The fact that God gives you this experience some 365 days a year, all the days of your life, may be like a little reminder that perhaps there are realities other than this physical world. But we don't need just to discover that ourselves. Baha'u'llah told us this in the Seven Valleys. He says, one of the created phenomena is the dream. Behold how many secrets are deposited therein, how many wisdoms treasured up, how many worlds concealed. Observe how thou art asleep in a dwelling and its doors are barred. On a sudden thou findest thyself in a far off city which thou entereth without moving thy feet or wearying thy body. Without using thine eyes, thou seest. Without taxing thine ears, thou hearest. Without a tongue, thou speakest. Now there are many wisdoms to ponder in the dream. What is this world where without eye and ear and hand and tongue a man puts all of these to use? Now, there are many statements in which Baha'u'llah says, this world is not reality. I'll read you a few of those. He says in Gleanings, the world is but a show, vain and empty, a mere nothing, bearing the semblance of reality. Verily I say, the world is like a vapor in the desert, which the thirsty dreameth to be water and striveth after it with all his might, until when he comes to find it, he findeth it to be mere illusion. The physical world is mere illusion. In the hidden words, Baha'u'llah says, Didst thou behold immortal sovereignty, thou wouldst strive to pass from this fleeting world, but to conceal one from thee and to reveal the other is a mystery which none but the pure in heart can comprehend almost like a, a great shell game of God, in which he says there's two worlds and we show you one and we hide the other. And the reason we do this is a mystery which none but the pure in heart can comprehend. Are there any pure in heart here that compre <laughs> comprehend this? Abdu'l Baha says, Know ye that the world is even as a mirage rising over the sands, that the thirsty maketh for water, the wine of this world is but a vapor in the desert. It's pity and compassion, but toil and trouble. The repose it proffereth, only weariness and sorrow. Abandon it to those who belong to it and turn your faces unto the kingdom of the Lord. You know how many I could read like this? I have a compilation at home. I think it's 10, 15 pages. I'll read one more, and then we'll go on. Adabaha says, life is of two kinds that of the body and that of the spirit. The life of the body is material life, but the life of the spirit expresses the existence of the kingdom, which consists in receiving the spirit of God and becoming vivified by the breath of the Holy Spirit. Although material life has existence, it is pure non-existence and absolute death for the holy saints. Kind of ironic. He says, although it has existence, it's really non-existence. He says, so man exists and this stone exists. But what a difference between the existence of man and that stone. Though the stone exists in relation to the existence of man, it is non-existent. <laughs> I love the way Adabha talks. Anyway, 
Do you get the idea? The physical world is not reality. Now, what is the second principle? It seems almost ironic, because the second principle is that the physical world is a symbolic representation of the spiritual world. Now, you say, wait a moment. You just said that the physical world doesn't exist, that it's not reality. It's just an illusion. And now the second principle says that, on the other hand, we're saying that the physical world has a great meaning. And yes, indeed, it does have great meaning. Its meaning is that it represents symbolically the spiritual world. There is a relationship in that one is a representation of the other. Think of it as a word. You know Baha'u'llah calls this world the kingdom of names? You've heard that. Because what is a name? A name has no reality. A name represents something that is reality. It's just a symbol. That's what this physical world is. I'm going to read you two statements by Abdu'l Baha, but I warn you when I read them that they are from the book Baha'i Prayers 9, which, as many of you know, is a collection of pilgrims uh, came back from Abdu'l Baha in 1900. So technically it's a pilgrim's note. It doesn't have the authority, but it's very interesting. It's supported by other quotes. I want to read to you what he said to the pilgrims in 1900. Abdu'l Baha was reported to have said, Life is of two kinds, material and spiritual. If we wish to understand what the spiritual life is, we must look to the material world, which is an outward figure or symbol of the inward spiritual reality. See what he's saying there? If we want to understand the spiritual world, where do we look? We look into the physical world. In another statement, Adabaha said, what time is it? Okay, I have to finish in one minute. Is that right? Is that right? What time do I have to finish? And it, it's now... Oh, you know my watch was upside down. I knew I was long-winded, but by half an hour was ridiculous. Okay. I apologize. Okay. The scientific principle of putting your watch right side up. Okay. Here's what Adabaha says. He says, every material thing we see around us represents some spiritual idea. Now let's think about that very carefully. Every material thing we see represents some spiritual idea. As there is an outward material reality, so there is also an inward spiritual reality. Take, for example, the sun. There is the material sun, there is also the spiritual sun. As the physical sun rises and sets, so also does the spiritual sun. When the sun rises, the darkness vanishes. So when the sun of truth arises, all errors and ignorance disappear. And he goes on in this vein. So he says, everything in the physical world is a representation of the spiritual world. We have rivers, we have mountains, we have valleys, we have electricity, we have magnetism, we have... There are spiritual rivers, there are spiritual valleys, there are spiritual magnetism, and so on and so forth. This is what Adabaha is saying. This is from the Tablet of the Universe. Have any of you seen the Tablet of the Universe? It's been published several times. The Persians, of course, have it, and you've seen it. It's called the law e if I pronounce it right, Aflakie, is that correct? I'd love for a Persian to read it in Persian, because the translation we have now may not be the best. But it's fascinating. It's entirely on the subject of science and the universe. And he talks many times. It's a long tablet. I couldn't read it all now, even in the half an hour that I have remaining. But I'm going to read you a few statements from this tablet of the universe of Adabaha. He says, From spiritual realities infer truths about the material world. For physical things are signs and imprints of spiritual things. I want to read that one more time. For physical things are signs and imprints of spiritual things. Every lower thing is an image and counterpart of a higher thing. Nay, earthly and heavenly, material and spiritual, all of these are connected one with another and are interrelated in such a manner that you will find that drops are patterned after seas 
and that atoms are structured after suns in the proportion to their capacity and potentialities. In another passage, he says, reflect upon the inner realities of the universe, the secret wisdoms involved, the enigmas, the interrelationships, the rules that govern all, for every part of the universe is connected with every other part by ties that are very powerful and admit of no imbalance. So from these statements, and I could read you plenty more, we realize that we can learn an enormous amount of spiritual truth by studying the world, by studying physics and chemistry and, the, and all the other sciences, because Adabaha says one is a mirror of the other. Now, fortunately, we uh, don't have to do this all on our own, because the manifestation of God has, to a very great extent, mapped the physical world to the spiritual. Pick up a copy of Gleanings, pick up a copy of Hidden Words, and you'll find that almost every time Baha'u'llah refers to a spiritual concept, he uses a physical analogy. When he talks about unity, he'll talk about the light of unity. When he talks about God, he might call him the sun of truth. When he talks about the human heart, he talks about the soil or the garden of the human heart. He talks about rivers, he talks about oceans, he talks about mountains. And we can learn a lot. We can learn an enormous amount about these spiritual concepts by going to the science and understanding, as he said, the relationships in the physical world and relate that to the spiritual world. I recall in, 19, I believe it's 1985 or 1986, I went to a Baha'i Studies Conference in Toronto, Ontario. And I got there late. I mean, like a day or two late. It wasn't my fault. I had something to do. I just can't remember what it is. Um, and when I got there, everyone was raving about this one talk that was like the best talk, and I missed it. And I heard it maybe 10 times. Oh, you should have heard that talk by Adib Taherzadeh on the human soul. And this was a very scholarly conference. They were professors and so on. And so I got this idea what the talk must have been like. And so finally I got a copy of it, transcription of it, and I read it, and I must say I was very surprised. I won't say disappointed, but surprised. Because rather than being a scholarly uh, uh, analysis of the human soul with you know, going back to Plato and all the analysis and, and so on, all he did was take one analogy that Baha'u'llah had made, that the human soul is like the human embryo. That's all. And he spent virtually the entire talk going in detail, comparing the principles. Rather than making a hundred points on a hundred things, he very deeply went into just one analogy that Baha'u'llah gave. And yet all of these scholars said it was the most profound talk they had ever seen. And I realized then and there that Baha'u'llah has mapped the physical world to the spiritual for us, and through science, we can greatly grasp spiritual truth by looking at these. But we sometimes tend to just pass them by. Baha'u'llah says, in the garden of thine heart plant not but the rose of love. And we say, ah, oh, that's just flowery language, and no pun intended. We, we, we think, ah, oh, it's just... Yeah. But maybe, is there, what is a garden? And, what is it? and think about this. And you can meditate on this, and you can find that he does this. Now, how many times does Baha'u'llah map a physical thing to a spiritual concept? I tried to count in the last couple of months, and I gave up. I gave up. Just so much is going on there. The interesting thing is, is that once you start to think along these lines, you realize that the spiritual world becomes much more concrete, much more consequential so to speak. You know, the, the physical world, we understand it's consequential. You do this, you do that, this happens. You pour that into a beaker, and you pour that into a beaker, and you die because it explodes, which happened to lots of scientists, by the way. You jump off a cliff, gravity takes over. We understand that science is consequential. But we seem to think that the spiritual world is some kind of vague, airy-fairy kind of thing. 
And yet, we don't realize that the spiritual world is just as ordered and just as consequential. I'll read you a statement from Shoghi Effendi. He says, just as there are laws governing our physical lives, requiring that we must supply our bodies with certain foods, maintain them with a certain range of temperatures and so forth, if we wish to avoid physical disabilities, so also there are laws governing our spiritual lives. Just as there are laws in the physical world, there are laws in the spiritual world. These laws are revealed to mankind in each age by the manifestation of God, and obedience to them is of vital importance if each human being and mankind in general is to develop properly and harmoniously. Moreover, these various aspects are interdependent. If an individual violates a spiritual law for his own development, he will cause injury not only to himself, but to the society in which he lives. So, what are the two great principles of the physical world? One is that the physical world is not reality. The second is that the physical world is a symbolic representation of the spiritual world. And so the corollary from this is that we can learn spiritual truth by the study of scientific knowledge. This is one of the great reasons why we need harmony of science and religion. Some of us may have imagined that what Adbaha was meaning by the harmony of science and religion was that science needs to get religion. You know, you guys are materialistic, you need to get religion. But Adbaha equally meant that our religion must be more scientific. I mean, this is what two wings of a bird means. So, I want to turn now my attention to applying this concept in the world, for what it means to us right now. Because I was asked to speak on the subject of how does the Baha'i faith meet the needs of today's age. And it can meet the needs of today's age if we can more fully grasp certain spiritual principles. And so, for the remainder of the speech today and all tomorrow, I'm going to take spiritual teachings and map them to scientific principles. And we're going to see how this works. I'll use the actual analogies that Baha'u'llah or Ad Baha used, and we'll explore them and see if it does not give us spiritual insight by looking at these things. But before we do that, before we look at it, we really need to understand what is wrong with us. Okay? There are really two things that are necessary for a doctor to cure a patient. There are two things necessary for a doctor to cure a patient. And remember, we are told that the manifestation of God is the divine physician. And what are the two things that the doctor must do? The doctor must first be able to diagnose what's wrong. He must know what's wrong with the patient. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what he does. The second thing is he must then know what is the remedy for that thing that's wrong. Without these two elements, medicine is also just a superstition. And we will also be stabbing in the dark if we try to apply certain spiritual principles to the world today if they're not exactly addressing what is wrong. And Baha'u'llah spoke about this concept very eloquently when he said every age has its own needs. And then he says, be ye anxiously concerned with the needs of your own age. So we need to do that. Fortunately, we don't have to figure it out because Shoghi Effendi came along and basically defined what are the ills of today and what are the solutions. There are many places where Shoghi Effendi identifies and lists what's wrong with the world. The list I want to choose is one that comes from page uh, 124 of Citadel of Faith. I choose this one because it's addressed to the Baha'is of the United States. You'll find that certain lists that he'll send uh, say, this is what's wrong with the world, this is what's wrong with the world, they're slightly different. They usually have two or three of the same elements, and then one or two might be different. But the list that he sends to the United States in, I think, was Citadel was 56, 57, can anyone remember? In other words, it's the, the last great long letter he wrote to America. He said there were four things, four 
things uh, which are the ills of American society. And I believe there are ills in America at large, and there are ills in each and every one of our hearts, even as Baha'is, because none of us are completely free of these four ills. The first, he said, was a deterioration in the standard of morality. That's the first ill. Immorality. He refers it to the steady and alarming deterioration in the standard of morality. He lists five examples. He gives five examples. He says, as exemplified by. Now, before I tell you the five examples, I want you to imagine what do you think would be the best five examples that Shoghi Effendi might give. Okay? You only could choose five. Surely there's a hundred examples. But the Guardian only wants five. He doesn't want the book to go on forever. He's, it's very near his passing. You know, so, he, so he's only going to list five. What are the five that he's going to do? Okay. He says these are ex- exemplified by. Number one, he says the appalling increase in crime. Number two, by political corruption in ever-widening and higher circles. I wouldn't have necessarily made that in my top five, maybe. Maybe top 15. Political corruption by the loosening of the sacred ties of marriage. That's the third in his list. By the inordinate craving for pleasure and diversion. Okay, that's, that's my number one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> by the inordinate craving for pleasure and diversion. And here's the fifth one. Can anyone guess what the fifth one's going to be? You're not going to get it. By the marked and progressive slackening of parental control. That's his number five. And I see my daughters in the back there are nodding their head. Yes, thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? <laughs> That's Shoghi Effendi's example, five examples of the deteriorating standard of morality. So let's remember, because we're like doctors now, we're diagnosing What's wrong with us? What's the first thing that's wrong with us? The deteriorating standard of morality. Secondly, he says, parallel with this and pervading all departments of life is another evil. And that evil he defines as crass materialism. Crass materialism. And would you agree this is an evil too? And he gives examples of that. He says, crass materialism lays excessive and ever-increasing emphasis on material well-being, forgetful of those things of the spirit on which alone a sure and stable foundation can be laid for human society. It is this same cancerous materialism, born originally in Europe, carried to excess in North American continent, contaminating the Asiatic peoples and nations, spreading its ominous tentacles to the borders of Africa, and now invading its very heart, which Baha'u'llah unequivocally and emphatic language denounced in his writings, comparing it to a devouring flame and regarding it as the chief factor in precipitating the dire ordeals and world-shaking crises that must necessarily involve the burning of cities and the spread of consternation and terror. So what's number one? What's the first one? Immorality. What's the second? Crass materialism. I like crass. Crass materialism. I'm going to use crass from now on. Okay. The third one. The third ill that he says besets American society, I would not have got. I don't think I would have chosen it. But it's right there, page 124, Citadel of Faith. And he says, it's the darkening of the political horizon. Now, he's writing this in 1956, and he's explaining how America is caught up in this vortex of political, geopolitical affairs, and she will not be able to pull herself out of it. At the time, of course, it had to do with communism, uh, you know, Russia and, and so on, and, and but we can see that this has not abated since he stated it. In fact, if anything, it has gotten worse. And we are caught up in this 
whole process, it is basically the crumbling of the old world order. And America, for some reason, is caught up in it. It's interesting because the first principle, one of the examples was political corruption. And the third principle is the darkening of the political horizon. It seems America has a little bit of problem with politics. Okay, just you know, from what I'm reading here. So that's three out of the four. Three out of the four ills are what? Darkening of the political horizon. Who could guess what the fourth ill is? Just think. I'm sorry? Prejudice? More information, please. Racism and racism towards the black, specifically. That prejudice. It's racism. This is one of the four biggies. I'm going to read to you the entire statement that Shogi Pendi says, in which he says this is the fourth ill. He says, no less serious is the stress and strain imposed on the fabric of American society through the fundamental and persistent neglect. He says the fundamental, it's a fundamental neglect and it's a persistent neglect by the governed and the governors alike of the supreme and inescapable and urgent duty, the neglect of a duty, so repeatedly and graphically represented and stressed by Abdu'l-Bahá in his arraignment of the basic weaknesses of the social fabric of the nation, the neglect, he says, of remedying while there is yet time through a revolutionary change in the concept and attitude of the average white American towards his fellow Negro citizen, a situation which, if allowed to drift, will, in the words of Abdu Baha, cause the streets of American cities to run with blood. That's the fourth. So these are the four things that we should probably say we want to get rid of. Let's not make our own list. Let's let the doctor diagnose what's wrong with us. And let's not say this is what's wrong with them. Let's say this is what's wrong with me. And how can we get rid of these four ills? Because surely society will transform the quickest if we take the remedy for the ills that are really besetting us. And so we want to find what are the principles, what are the scientific principles that we can apply and what are the spiritual principles that we can apply to resolve these four? So what I plan to do tomorrow is to look at certain spiritual principles I find in the writings and relate them to scientific concepts and see how they can address these four ills. And so that I will leave you because I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to say tomorrow. Okay? But believe me, it'll be a whole lot better than what I said just now. Because... <laughs> Basically, all I wanted to do now was to introduce the concept. Tomorrow, I want to apply the concept, if that makes any sense. So that's the end of my talk. And believe it or not, this is an historic occasion. I have actually finished less time than, uh, than I had allotted because uh, I got scared at first. So if anybody wants to ask any question, maybe one or two, and then we're going to go right on it. If Jack McCants is, is he here? I'm sure he's here, right? Is Jack here? Okay, Jack is not here. Okay, so if anyone wants to ask any questions uh, or make any comments, you're more than welcome. Yes. Yesterday, let's just summarize what we have discussed so far. Yesterday, we talked about the great principle of the harmony of science and religion. And we found that Abdu Baha has said that science and religion are like two wings of a bird. Both of them must be equally strong. Society will only evolve and develop when these two are equally strong, and we live in a period of time now in which there is an imbalance. Secondly, we looked at the two great principles of the physical world that we find in the Baha'i Writings. Does anyone remember what these two great principles are? Remember? You don't remember? Principle number one is that the physical world is not reality. Physical world is not reality. And principle number two 
is that the physical world is a symbolic representation of the spiritual world. It's, it's not reality, but it represents something. And then we looked at what Adabaha said about the value of studying the physical world in order to gain spiritual insight. Adabaha said, if we wish to understand what the spiritual life is, we must look to the material world, which is an outward figure or symbol of the inward reality. So if you want to understand, if you want to gain spiritual insight, you can gain spiritual insight by studying the various relationships and principles in the physical world, and these things give you spiritual insight. Then we discussed the ills that affect modern society, the evils in today's world, and we found that Shoghi Effendi had identified four of them to the American believers in the 1950s. Do you remember what those four are? Immorality, that's right, immorality was one of them. I'm sorry? Racism, yes, racism. I'm sorry? Political corruption, correct, very good. Crass materialism, those were the four. Okay, and you might recall that I said to you yesterday that we can look at ways of addressing these problems by applying spiritual principles. Spiritual principles are the way in which you address a problem. And then I also said that why don't we try out what Adabaha said, look at the spiritual principles and see if we can find a physical analogy, a scientific analogy that will give us insight. If Adabaha says that you can understand something spiritual better by relating it to an analogy in the physical world, then let's try it to address these four problems. So, what I did was, I went in the Baha'i writings and I tried to see what are the greatest spiritual principles to address these four issues. What spiritual principles could we look at and could we study? And I found many, many spiritual principles. Then I thought about the four problems, the four ills of the world, and I looked at some other references where Shoghi Fendi talked about the ills of the world, and suddenly I realized that the ills of the world fall into two broad categories. They fall into two basic categories. One category is the ills that are primarily concerned with individuals, with you personally, things that you must do yourself. These are the ills of materialism, immorality, ungodliness, irreligion, and so on. Then there's another category of ills which relate to society. They're collective problems and these relate to society. And these are the ills of political corruption, for example, nationalism, war, disorder in the world. All of these kind of problems have a more collective thing. So I said, what are the spiritual principles for collective problems and what are the spiritual principles for individual problems? And I found many dozens of principles. But after studying them very carefully, I found what I believe to be the primary principle for each of these two. What I consider to be the main principle to correct the collective problems of mankind and the main principle to correct the individual or the human problems. And I call these the two first principles. It's not in the writings, it doesn't say two first principles. Don't look it up. But this is what I'm going to call it. So what is the greatest principle to address the collective problems of mankind. What do you think it might be? Very good, thank you. Unity. In fact, unity is the pivotal principle around which all the Baha'i teachings revolve. That's what Shoghi Effendi said. The pivotal principle. Now, something that's pivotal means that everything else revolves around it. The principle of unity is far more complex than what we may initially imagine it to be. I said yesterday that as Baha'is, we need to sometimes go to the dictionary and erase the definition and then write in the new one. Well, there's nothing bigger than unity. You would need to erase the definition of unity in the dictionary and put a book in its place because of what Baha'u'llah has said about it. So we're going to first look at unity as the primary spiritual principle to address the collective problems of mankind. Then we're going to look 
at the primary principle for human you know, individual development second. And what do you think the primary principle is? What do you think would be, if you looked all over the Baha'i writings and, and tried to find it, what do you think would be the primary principle to correct human ills? Love, service, truthfulness, prayer. The number one principle. Humility, certitude. I found all of these, by the way, but one, one was higher. Obedience? No, that was number 92. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. We'll do unity first and look at it scientifically. And then when we come to this, we'll, you, shall be, you shall find out what I believe is the primary principle. Okay? I, I won't tell you now. Let's just think about it while we deal with unity. So let's go to unity and let's look at some of the scientific principles that relate to unity. The first analogy that I find in the Baha'i writings that gives us a clue as to what unity relates to in the physical world is the comparison of unity to light. The comparison of unity to light. I did a search quickly in Ocean, you know, that's the computer program. And I, I said, give me all the sentences in the Baha'i writings that have the word light and unity in the same sentence. How many do you think I got? 278. Okay, that has light and unity. Now, some of those may be reprints of the same quote, you know, maybe Shoghi Fendi quoted Baha'u'llah, but still, a lot of them were unique. Baha'u'llah says, so powerful is the light of unity that it can envelop the earth. Sometimes we read statements like this and we just think, oh, it's just nice language. But maybe when we come across something where Baha'u'llah says the light of unity, we should stop and say, wait a moment. What are the principles of light? What are the characteristics of light? Why did he relate light to uni unity to light. If you'd asked me, like, Tom, you know, what are you going to make unity like? I may not think of light first. I might think glue or, I don't know, we, you know, so powerful is the glue of unity or something. I, I mean, uh, light, light doesn't immediately spring to mind as being the physical symbol of unity. And yet in 278 places, Baha'u'llah refers to unity as light. So why does he do this? So quickly, I, I, uh, uh, I wrote down what I think are some of the basic scientific principles of light. Just, just wrote them down quickly. Number one, light sheds clarity on things. Would you agree? Light sheds clarity on things. Number two, light is a spectrum of individual discrete colors. You know that light is not one thing. Light is actually... Uh, a spectrum of colors, seven colors in fact, and that's why many musicians like to refer to light as an octave. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, and sometimes when light hits something and then it bends because it reflects, the speed of light is different for each of those colors and you can see the colors separated. You can see this in a rainbow, you can see it on soap bubbles, you can see it on a CD if you turn it upside down. You'll see the individual colors of light reflected and you realize that light is actually a collection of individual colors. The third thing I wrote down about light is it is the fastest moving thing in creation. Okay, this is what Einstein postulated, light is the fastest moving thing in creation. If unblocked, if light is not blocked, it will travel forever. This is one of the scientific principles of light. In other words, we have light that is unblocked. It comes to us from billions of years ago. It just doesn't stop. You can't stop light uh, from moving if it's unblocked. These are just some of the principles I wrote down. Another principle I wrote down of light is light is created by movement at the atomic level. The creation of light, whether it be by the sun, or any artificial means, but not artificial, because there is no artificial way to create light. The way in which we create light, or the way the sun creates light, is by electrons, which are the little things that spin around the nucleus of the atom. They get excited, and they, they move uh, to a certain orbit, and they come back down. And it's the movement coming back down from the excited state that causes the emanation of electromagnetic waves, some of which are light. Light is the result of movement and action. It's just a scientific principle. And of course, another great principle of light is that light is the means whereby we, our eyes perceive physical creation. It's a scientific axiom 
that we do not see physical creation. Let's make that very clear. Your eyes do not see the physical world. Your eyes only see light. Um, your eyes basically see only circumstantial evidence that physical creation exists. What does circumstantial evidence mean? Circumstantial evidence is like if you walk into a house and you see all over the floor horse manure and you say, there must be a horse around here somewhere. Okay. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that, that is consistent with something being true, but doesn't prove it. That's what circumstantial, it means it's consistent, but it doesn't prove it. There could be another reason why the, the, that horse manure is on the floor, but it's probably, you know, uh, it's probably that a horse was there. So that's why you say it. Of course, if you have other circumstantial evidence, maybe you see horse footprints or horse hair on the ground, then maybe a lot of circumstantial evidence proves something. But still, a good lawyer is going to get that horse off, you know, for, for, for good behavior. Because circumstantial evidence doesn't prove. And here's what happens. Light goes into physical creation, and physical matter reflects light or does something to it. It either absorbs some of it and sends only some of the color spectrum back, absorbs all of it, or it reflects it, or it refracts it, it goes through, or it bends it, and so on. In other words, physical matter does something to light. And we see what physical matter did to that light. And then circumstantially we deduce that physical creation exists. So light is the only means by which we know something exists. These are just some scientific principles. I just wrote them down uh, because I'm saying, well, are, do any of these contain any clues to why Baha'u'llah decided that unity was a light? So I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking, okay, Shedding clarity on things. If unity sheds clarity on things, then how does it do it? And it seemed to me, when I, I just thought about this a little bit, that if we have diversity and if we value diversity and we look at the points of view of people, perhaps we will get more clarity and more understanding. Maybe this is one of the great features of unity. Think of the old analogy where they say, imagine you have five blind men and they're all surrounding an elephant. And one blind man says, an elephant is like a snake because he's feeling the tail of the elephant. And another one says, the elephant is like this or that. He says, it's like a big hose, you know, because he's feeling the, the trunk of the elephant. So, and every, every person has a completely different understanding of what the elephant is because they're only feeling a certain part of it. Let's imagine instead that, that these are five men in a completely dark cave with an elephant, and they have eyes now. And each one has a little flashlight, just a pencil flashlight. And one can see the tail, and one can see the, uh, the trunk, and one can see the foot, and so on. But none of them can see the whole elephant. I remember a, a high friend of mine, he told me, and this was just you know a month or two ago, he said he was in a local assembly meeting. And he said something, and he told me what it was. Actually, he told me the thing first, and it was the most profound, beautiful concept, but it was quite hard to understand. But the way he said it, it was so beautiful. And I said, oh, you know, that's a really beautiful insight you have there. He says, well, it's funny you say so, because I said it in a local assembly meeting not too long ago, and they all frowned at me and ridiculed me, uh, and, and I felt very, very humiliated at the assembly meeting. And, and I said to him, you know, try to comfort him, I said, well, you know, you, you're a very deep thinker and very different, and maybe they just didn't really understand the wavelength that you were on when you said that, but it hurt him very much. And then it occurred to me that the chairman of that assembly, who had basically just poo-pooed him, was faced with a choice when that came to this chairman in the assembly meeting. The choice was to either have two eyes or four eyes. Any time someone comes to you with a new idea or a different expression from a different background and they express something that you cannot grasp, you have the choice of just keeping your two eyes or getting their two eyes and suddenly you have four eyes. This choice faces you every day of your life and every moment of your consultation. If we let ourselves see through all of the eyes in a local assembly meeting, we would have 18 eyes. You see, and that is why unity is a light. So imagine we're in this cave and everyone has a little pencil flashlight. If we turn them all on, we can see the whole elephant because 
Light sheds clarity, but only if you embrace diversity and you seek it out. We have to reprogram our brains because at the moment our brains tell us any idea that's contrary to ours equals bad. It's like a little formula. Idea not coinciding with our idea, bad thing. We need to change that now. An idea that's presented that's different to ours equals great. Two more pairs of eyes. A completely new paradigm. And it's going to be difficult to reprogram ourselves. But this then makes unity like a light because then it sheds clarity on, on things. I thought again about unity and I found that quite often Abdu'l-Baha, Baha'u'llah, they related human beings to various metals. You know, iron, steel, gold, silver, you, you understand? And of course, metals are unique in, in physical creation, and that's why it, man is often symbolized by metals, because metal is unique. It can, be, it can be forged, it can be changed into various shapes. You can make it this shape, that shape. You can transform it. It bends without breaking. Most things, you, you do that, and, and they break, you know, but metal, you bend, and so on. So this scientific principle of metal is very interesting. So I tried to look at unity in relation to this. And I found there's a very interesting principle. It's called metallic bonding. It's part of the great basic category of atomic bonding in which atoms bond together in various ways. And one way which they bond is covalent bonding and, and so on. There's different ways. But metallic bonding is unique amongst all the bondings of all the atoms because only in metallic bonding do they completely share each other's electrons. It's complicated. I don't want to go into it. But I want to tell you something that's very interesting because this relates to unity. About 3,200, 3, 3,300 BC, say about 5,000 years ago, a very interesting thing happened in the world. Somebody, I don't know who, but maybe a lot of people, they discovered that if you took an element copper and if you blended it with the element tin, it created bronze. Now, you may say, well, what's so great about that? Well, let me tell you what they discovered. Copper is a very soft metal. And in fact, all pure metals are fairly soft. You can't do much with copper. You can't make a knife out of it because it can't go to a sharp point. Uh, you can't make an ax out of it because if you hit something, it just ends up being the shape of <laughs> the thing you hit. Uh, you, uh, you can't make tools out of it. It's basically just useful for you know pots and, and, and cups and so on, and not very useful. It's a very soft metal. You take a copper wire and pull it, you can just break it. You know that. OK. Tin is even softer than copper. Now, after man discovered fire and heat and then discovered that he could melt these things, somebody said, let's just mix copper and tin. I want you to think about this very carefully. You take copper, which is a very weak element, you mix it with a bit of tin, which is weaker, and it creates something that's three times, more than three times stronger than copper. You add something weaker to it, and it's more than three times stronger. Unity in diversity in the metallurgic realm creates strength. And of course, we know now the scientific reason why this, you know, we, we can go into it has to do with the fact that atoms that are slightly different, they hold together better because they don't slip and so on. I don't want to go into this. But isn't this fascinating that you can take two things and they're diverse, but if you unite them, the result is three or four times stronger than either of the two. If this isn't scientific unity and diversity, I don't know what it is. But the story is even more fascinating because we mark an entire age of human history by this discovery alone. Human history, early prehistory, is defined by the, the Stone Age, in which they had tools of stone, then the Bronze Age, later on the Iron Age. But the Bronze Age completely transformed every part of human civilization from the way in which they live, the way in which they farm, the way in which they build cities and boats and tools. Every aspect of human society changed with just the discovery of this one principle of metallic bonding. Might it not be the same that when we discover the principle of human unity and diversity that it will also create an entirely new age. Things that were not possible 
will become possible by the discovery of this principle, a new age based on unity in human diversity, just as a new age was created in the discovery of unity in physical diversity. The, the parallel is there, and we were already told by Aldebaran that the physical world mirrors the spiritual. So, metallic bonding, that's another scientific principle. The next principle I find is the principle of magnetism. Now, magnetism is kind of related because magnets are, are metallic, you know, copper can be a magnet, of course, and, and metal and iron. And I quickly typed in the word magnet in the Baha'i writings to see how much. I found there's 194 references to, the, to magnet. I didn't even look up magnetism, but in other words, many things are, are called magnets in the Baha'i writings. I also just looked up lodestone because, as you know, a lodestone is a magnet as well. And I found uh, several, many more references to lodestones as well and so on. So it's quite obvious that the manifestation of God, Shoghi Effendi, Adabaha, were very interested in magnetism as a principle. And so I said, uh, how does that relate to unity? Well, first of all, we're told by Shoghi Effendi that unity is a magnet. He says, the Baha'is should realize that the atmosphere of true love and unity which they manifest within the Baha'i community will directly affect the public and be the greatest magnet for attracting the people to the faith. In another quote, Shoghi Effendi says, the spirit and love among the friends in discussing, arranging, and carrying out the activities of the faith will become as a magnet which will attract the divine bounties. And then I, I looked up all the other ones, the 100, other 194, and I found that various things are told to us to be magnets in the Baha'i faith. Houses of worship are told to us to be magnets. Local assemblies are told to us to be magnets. Activity is told to us to be magnets. And service to the faith. In many places, he says, service to the faith is a magnet. And so I realized that there's various principles. Now, I've had the opportunity of hearing uh, Peter Kahn, who's professor of electromagnetism uh, in his profession, but is now a member of the House of Justice. And he always likes to point out, whenever we come across one of these writings on magnets, he likes to point out what is the difference between a magnet and something that's not magnet. Because he says, you know, we should become magnets. And he says, if you take a bar of iron that is not a magnet, and you take a bar of iron that is magnet and study to find out the differences, he says you'll find that there are no differences in the elements. A magnet, a magnetic bar of iron, doesn't contain anything more in terms of atoms or elements than the magnetic. They don't, they don't contain anything different. The only difference is in the arrangement, the organization of, of, the, of the atoms. That's the only difference. So you have something, you have a group of people that have no power, you arrange a certain way, and suddenly a magic power appears. And this is fascinating, isn't it? That merely by organization and by order, a power can be created. A power can be created. And this is very interesting because unity is a magnet if you do it. I want you to think very carefully from now on about service to the faith and imagine that you are magnetizing yourself or in relation to the Baha'i community you are creating a great magnet. I want you to think about the five-year plan right now. Imagine it that if we are more obedient to it, we are magnetizing ourselves and our Baha'i communities as we're driving to our study circles, or our prayer meetings, or our intensive programs of growth, or reflection meetings, say, I am magnetizing myself. It's a great spiritual principle that we deduce from magnetism. It's, it's such a beautiful concept because Abdu Baha, I'll read you what he says. He talks about magnetism as the orientation of hearts and souls to God. He says this, Note that thy Lord hath manifested the magnet, and he puts it in a capital M. So it's like this is the manifestation of God, or, or something. Or He says, note thy Lord hath manifested the magnet of the souls and hearts in the pole of the existing world, and he capitalized pole. So it's like God is the pole and, 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 and the magnet. He says, to which all the sacred hearts are attracted from far distant lands and countries, 
The iron body is attractable, although at long distances away. So we can be attracted. So the concept that we're all facing one way, because that's really what happens in a, in a magnet. You know, it all flows in one direction. It, it's from that direction, it comes out. In that direction, it comes there. That's the two poles of a magnet. It's the flow. Electricity also flows this way. Where does a, a magnet point? North? That's not right. Where does a magnet point? It's just wherever the pole happens to be. The pole changes. Okay, about every 200,000 years, the pole is down over here, and then it moves up and back and forth, just like the manifestation of God. You know, the manifestation of God keeps appearing, and wherever he appears, you can go to rocks in the earth, and if they're a certain age, they point south. You know, magnetic rocks, they, they point it south. Because just like the manifestation of God, there's a, the analogy of the pole and the manifestation of God and the human being magnets, you know, oriented is complete in creation. Isn't that fascinating? So unity is a magnet. And if we can just arrange ourselves, uh, we'll find this. Okay, I found a third principle, a third scientific principle related to unity. And in science, we call this the principle of complementarity. Now, it's a very simple thing to understand, but I want to explain to you what it is. In several passages of the Baha'i writings, we are told an example, which is the principle of complementarity. When Adha Baha'i uses the analogy of two wings of a bird, and he uses this analogy in relation to two great issues. One, the equality of men and women, and two, the harmony of science and religion. He uses the same analogy for both. Men and women are like two wings of a bird, and science and religion are like two wings of a bird. And this is the scientific principle of complementarity. That principle says that two things can only function if they exist with both. And the elimination of one means the other one has absolutely no capability. You have a bird with one wing, it can't do anything. And you can see this. Complementarity must be meditated upon. In fact, in the Buddhist or Eastern religions, they meditated on this principle. It's a very important principle in Chinese philosophy, yin and yang, and the basic koans, which, you know, the koans which they meditate. I'll talk about that in a moment. But you must meditate very carefully on complementarity. You must keep thinking about it. Think about equality of men and women, and think about the two wings of the bird, and meditate upon it. We see complementarity all about us in the world. You know, uh, if I cut off one of my legs, then I lose the principle of complementarity. Can I walk just half as fast as I can with one leg or with two? No, hardly, but not even go. One time I broke my thumb. Have you ever broken a thumb? I broke my thumb, and for the first time I realized how useless these four fingers were without the thumb. I couldn't even button my shirt. I said, boy, I mean, just the thumb, the fact that it's the principle of complementarity. And, and of course, I remember anthropologists said that the development of the thumb in human evolution was, was one of the most significant parts of development because having that. And I realized then, oh yes, complementarity, even in human evolution. It's a very important principle. There is an old, it's, it comes from Chinese philosophy, it's a meditative concept. It says, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And you're told to meditate on this. Now, you don't meditate on it to figure out the answer. No, it's a facetious question. The answer is implied by the question. What is the sound of one hand clapping? It's nothing. It's nothing. Because the principle of complementarity says that sometimes 50% is 0%. And we meditate on that. Now, think about equality of men and women in the principle of complementarity. 50% is 0%. Think about the principle of complementarity in harmony of science and religion. 50% is 0%. And this is why the Chinese meditated on this principle. What is the sound of one clapping? Keep thinking about it. What can your one hand do without the other hand? Absolutely nothing. It's as far as clapping is concerned. You just try it. Okay, everyone right now. You didn't hear a thing. Okay, let's give a really big one-hand applause right now. Okay, nothing. Okay? That's what we're doing right now in relation to men and women. Obviously, then, we don't have equality 
between men and women right now. Would you agree? Because we would be doing. And so whatever Adabaha means by flying, that the bird will fly, we don't know what that is. We're not flying right now. But this is a great scientific principle, complementarity, that we can study in the physical world and then relate it to these spiritual principles and suddenly we gain spiritual insight, as Adabaha had promised. When I think about unity, I think how challenging it is for Baha'is, because we don't really have a good idea of what unity means. As I said, you need to go to your dictionary and erase the meaning and redefine it. I know that Baha'u'llah has a completely different concept of unity than we have, because he said in Gleanings, and I quote, no two men can be found who may be said to be outwardly and inwardly united. And I, I'd say, no, I'm sure you can find somebody. You know. So, in other words, his concept of unity is something far different. It's something quite different. And Shoghi Effendi talked a long time about what the Baha'i concept of unity is, the oneness of mankind and unity. And he said, let's not make any mistake what we mean by it. He basically said, unity is not some notion where we all get together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. He basically said it. He didn't put it exactly in those words. <laughs> but he could have put it in those words. So let, let's, let's see what words he used. He says here, let there be no mistake. The principle of the oneness of mankind is no mere outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. See, he could have said, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. In fact, he, he probably was deciding, let's, should, we go with, <laughs> should we go with Kumbaya or ignorant emotionalism, expression of vague and pious hope? Oh, let's take the vague and pious hope. But he could have taken the other, right? And so often we think of unity as, oh, can't we all get along? Let's hold hands. Let's sing Kumbaya. That's what we think unity means. And Shogun says, let there be no mistake. Well, there is a mistake. And so then he goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs, and this is, uh, as you know, in the World Order Letters. And he just says all of the things which unity really means. He says, well, I'll read some of it, you know. And, and uh, He says, let there be no mistake. The oneness of mankind is no mere outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. Don't you love that vague and pious hope? He says... Its appeal is not merely identified with the reawakening of a spirit of brotherhood and goodwill amongst men, nor does it aim solely at fostering harmonious cooperation among individuals and peoples. Its implications are deeper, its claims greater than any which the prophets of old were allowed to advance. Its message is applicable not only to the individual, but concerns itself primarily with the nature of those essential relationships that must bind all the states and nation members of one human family. It does not merely constitute the enunciation of an ideal, but stands inseparably associated with an institution adequate to embody its truth. And he goes on to explain that unity and the oneness of mankind is not just brotherhood. It needs order, it needs government, it needs the world order of Baha'u'llah, it needs all of these things, because unity is like the organization of a magnet. Organization is required to create unity. If you have a chance, go to World Order Baha'u'llah. That quote I, I started is on page uh, 42. And read it over and over again and meditate on what unity really means in the Baha'i faith. And go to your dictionary and erase that definition as soon as you've finished. I also find it interesting that Adabaha has described unity in terms that it's better to be united than to be right. This is so foreign to our understanding and our culture that we should just step back and say, whoa, Adabaha, it's better to be united than to be right. Unity goes higher than correctness or being right. I'll read you a statement about this because this is such a challenging principle. He says, it is my hope that the friends and the maidservants of America become united on all subjects and not disagree at all. If they agree upon a subject, even though it be wrong, it is better 
than to disagree and be in the right. For this difference will produce the demolition of the divine foundation. Though one of the parties may be in the right and they disagree, that will be the cause of a thousand wrongs. But if they agree and both parties are in the wrong, as it is in unity, the truth will be revealed and the wrong point made right. Now, I can't tell you how foreign that is to the concept of American democracy, individual rights and freedoms, and so on. We really need to think very carefully about this. Shoghi Effendi, one time, I'm going to read this, Shoghi Effendi talked about the Baha'is in Iran and when they were having a little bit of squabbles. I know it's surprising to you to think that Iranians would ever have any disagreements or arguments amongst each other. <laughs> but apparently that's the case, and The Guardian wrote about this, and I'm going to read you what he said. The Guardian writes, During the days of Baha'u'llah, some of the prominent teachers of the cause in Persia were divided as to the station of Baha'u'llah, and at last wrote to him for arbitration. So they wrote to Baha'u'llah. And so Baha'u'llah had to tell them who was right and who was wrong. You know, one believed this, one that. And so they all said, oh, Baha'u'llah, tell us you know, which side is right. Shoghi Fendi continues, In answer, Baha'u'llah said that if they were united, both sides were right. And if they were divided, both were wrong. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's a very big point, and this comes from an Iranian, you know? In fact, <laughs> in fact, weren't you the one that wrote to Baha'u'llah for that? Yes. So this, this is a very challenging issue. This is a very, very challenging issue for us to accept the fact that unity is, has a higher priority than being right. And believe it or not, I know many Baha'is who have been so hung up on the principle that they are right and has caused disunity that this attachment to being right has caused them sometimes to lose their connection to the Baha'i community, to the very faith itself. Devoted believers have lost their connection to the faith, sometimes even to the covenant, over, over an appreciation. Marriages have been destroyed. Relationships with individuals have been destroyed because they have valued being right over unity. And we're told that unity has a priority over that. Clearly then, the principle of unity, the pivotal principle around which revolves all the social Baha'i teachings, is something we need to study and to try and understand and to try and grasp. And maybe some of the scientific principles that have analogies helps us to do so. And so I call your attention to that. Let's move on then, because uh, I can say more on unity, but I think we want to get on to the, the uh, second principle I want to talk about. And that is the principle that addresses human problems. And I asked you before, what do you think would be the primary principle? Selflessness, not bad. What is it? I'm sorry? Tolerance? These are all good. But every one of these revolves around a principle. In other words, when we talk about unity, a lot of Baha'i principles are around unity. I'm like, the principles of administrative order, that's unity, right? Consultation, that falls under unity. Equality of men and women, that falls under unity. World government, that falls under unity. Universal education falls under unity. Auxiliary language. Unity of religions, racism, elimination of prejudice. You understand? So there are many, many Baha'i teachings, but they come under the broad heading of unity. So what is the broad heading for all of these things you said? All right. Tell you what. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. And I get this, and I, I was just looking in the writings to find words like primary or first or most important or something like this. And I finally found that in the Baha'i writings, the primacy for individual development can be summarized in the principle of the purification of the human heart. This is what I found is the primary principle. The purification of the human heart has primacy over all of these other things. It is an organizing canopy by which we can put so many of these other principles you said. I gained this, for example, the, the idea of the primacy of this principle from the very first hidden word. The very first. And not only is the first, he says, my first counsel is this. Possess a pure, kindly and radiant heart. Purify your heart. I get this also from Baha'u'llah in the Kitab-i-Khan when he lists the steps which any seeker must take 
to attain his journey on the path of truth. And he says, one thing must be done first. I'll read that. When a true seeker determineth to take the step of search in the path leading unto the knowledge of the Ancient of Days, he must, before all else, what does before all else mean? It gives it primacy. Before all else, he must cleanse his heart. You see? So this is why I decided to put it up there. Then I found something even more interesting. All Baha'u'llah wants is our heart. He doesn't want anything else. He says in Gleanings, The one true God, exalted be his glory, hath bestowed the governments of the earth upon the kings. To none is given the right to act in any manner that would run counter to the considered views of them. That which he hath reserved for himself are the cities of men's hearts. Baha'u'llah only wants your heart. He just wants your heart. And so I decided that we'll use this and we'll study the human heart in relation to scientific principles. Now, before I do this, let's first of all define what is the human heart. Some of us may think that the human heart is the organ here on the left side of our chest that pumps blood. Okay? In fact, many languages and cultures do not use that particular organ to represent what we think of as the heart. Many cultures use the liver, many use the neck, some use the head, the stomach is quite common, and so on. In fact, I, I read a book, uh, not a book, but an article on this subject where they studied what every language and culture has used in the body to represent this thing. And the most common was liver, isn't that interesting? The liver was more common. And, and people that use liver, you know, they, they probably, I imagine that that they would probably have songs like, you know, I love you with all my liver, or, <laughs> or, 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 or don't go break in my liver, or <laughs> home is where the liver is, and uh, maybe I left my liver in San Francisco, you know, <laughs> something like that. Yes, per Persians, they, they, they use liver as the, exactly. And so the, the human heart that we're talking about is not this physical organ that pumps blood. In, in New Guinea, we used to use stomach. In all the translations they have their heart, they say, you know, unite the stomachs of thy servants. In, <laughs> no, is anyone here from New Guinea? Is, we do that. And of course, in America, you couldn't unite the stomachs because they're too big. But, but, <laughs> but, so when we talk about the heart, we're talking about something that has no physical location. We're talking about the seat of our affections, the seat of our desires, our emotions. And Adabaha said that the heart comes under this big, broad concept which is spiritual. It's part of mind. You know how he talks about mind and soul and spirit, and mind is the highest part of our soul or our spirit, and mind has you know, the heart and the intellect. Intellect is also spiritual. This is what we're talking about heart. When your physical organ, your liver, or your, your physical heart goes, this heart exists. And this is the thing we're talking about, cleansing. Baha'u'llah says, Thy heart is my home. Sanctify it for my descent. So he wants you to sanctify the heart. So I said, okay, what are some of the analogies that Baha'u'llah uses, or Adi Baha'u'llah uses, for heart? And the first thing I found is that heart is most often made analogous to soil. I found that heart is most often made analogous to soil. In other words, the human heart has the same physical prop same spiritual properties as the physical properties of soil. There's an old song called Heart and Soul. Baha'i should change it to Heart and Soil, because that's the principle. I'm going to read you two hidden words, and I want you to tell me the difference between them. This is number 33 from the Persian. Hearken to the delightsome words of my honeyed tongue, and quaff the stream of mystic holiness from my sugar-shedding lips. Sow the seeds of my divine wisdom in the pure soil of thy heart, and water them with the water of certitude, that the highest sense of my knowledge and wisdom may spring up fresh and green, the sacred city of thy heart. Tell me uh, what's the difference between that hidden word and this one, number 78 in the Persian. Quaff from the tongue of the merciful the stream of divine mystery, and behold from the dayspring of divine utterance the unveiled splendor of the daystar of wisdom. Sow the seeds of my divine wisdom 
in the pure soil of the heart and water them with the waters of certitude that the highest sense of knowledge and wisdom may spring up fresh and green in the holy city of thy heart. What's the difference between the two? They're pretty much the same, aren't they? The last sentence is word for word, except sacred and holy are different. And sacred and holy mean pretty much the same. So Baha'u'llah pretty much repeats himself. He repeats himself. Now, manifestation of God is allowed to repeat himself. You'd agree with that, right? Except in the hidden words, this is quite startling. Because we are promised in the beginning of the hidden words that Baha'u'llah will be brief. He says, we have taken the inner essence of what the, has been revealed under the prophets of old and clothed it in the garment of brevity. So Baha'u'llah says, I am going to be brief. And yet in being brief, he repeats one thing virtually word for word. No two other hidden words are as similar as these two. And it the, happens to be the hidden word in which he compares the human heart to soil. He repeats himself. And you can easily remember that he repeats himself because when we talk about repeating, we talk about a record or making a record or a broken record. And it just so happens that these two hidden words are number 33 and number 78. Okay? I have no idea why, but that not that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, so I said, okay, okay, so the human heart is like soil. The human heart is like soil, I said to myself. So I quickly, oh, it's not a joke. Okay, it's just to help you remember it. I'll tell you another thing, if, if, you, if that one doesn't, okay. For the people that can't remember the 33 and 78, Let's think of it this way. Soil, another, uh, another word for soil is the earth. You know, earth is soil. Remember that heart and earth are spelled with exactly the same letters. They're exactly, they're an N. Okay, you, in fact, you just take the H and take it from the beginning to the end. It becomes heart and earth, back and forth, heart and earth. So that'll help you there if you don't like the, if it's 73, if, the, if that's too hard for you. Okay. So anyway, so I quickly, like I did with Unity, I decided to write down what are some of the principles of soil? What are the, some of the scientific principles of soil? And I, I don't know a lot about soil, but you know, I just wrote down a few things. The first thing I realized is that many things will grow in soil. Not just one thing will grow in soil. You put a plant in soil, it will grow. So isn't this interesting? Because quite often we're told, only put this thing in your heart, don't put that thing in your heart. He, for example, he says, in the garden of thine heart, which is the same analogy, in the garden of the heart, plant naught but the rose of love. The implication clearly there is that other things you can put in that heart. Well, otherwise, why would he say it? How many of you actually have gardens? How difficult it is to keep other things away? It's, it's hard, isn't it? You have to tend to it all of the time. You have to watch it. If you, if you leave it for a week, you're in big trouble. Because the things that you didn't want, the naught but the roses of love, okay, they are the trees of something else, and, and the rose of love is dead. So this is the first principle, that soil is very fertile for many different plants. Therefore, the human heart must be fertile for many things, good and bad. The heart is not good or bad, it just gives growth to many things. That's the first principle. Second principle I gain from this is that Baha'u'llah is explaining that the word of God is like a seed. Like a seed. Isn't that interesting? In other words, it's just a seed. Think of a seed in relation to an oak tree or something like that. The difference between them. It's as if Baha'u'llah, sometimes when Baha'u'llah writes, he gives us all the teachings. Other times, he just gives us the seed. That's all it is. He gives you the seed. He knows that if you take it and you know where to plant it and water it. And what, what is water in this analogy? It's certitude. See, this is a very deep scientific analogy. Think about water and seed and, and plant and so on. And Baha'u'llah has explained to you what it means. But the, the concept that the word of God is just a seed. It's as if Baha'u'llah doesn't sometimes give you the treasure. He just gives you the treasure map. And then you have to take that map. 
and then you'll find the treasure. And you find the treasure by planting a seed in your heart, watering it with certitude, and it grows. This is a very deep concept that we can meditate upon. We could study soil science and agriculture and all kinds of things and gain tremendous spiritual insight just by looking at this principle. The third principle I find about soil and growth is that you need to tend to soil quite regularly. Both the good and the bad needs to be tended to. In other words, you need to, the good stuff that you want to grow, you need to water and, and nourish, and uh, you, you understand? And the bad things you need to pull out and weed. In other words, soil needs to be tended to. Would you agree? If you want it to work. And so this is another principle. We need to tend to the soil of our hearts. I hope that gradually we can carry around in our minds that our heart is soil and keep this analogy because it's very, very simple. Another uh, principle is that, that the good things need water. They must be watered. You cannot just expect to throw a seed there and it will grow. You must nourish it. Another important principle, and this is very important, is you need to be able to identify what are the weeds and the bad plants. If you don't know what they are, if you go into your garden sometimes and say, oh, what is that? Is that good or bad? Can I eat that? You know, sometimes I don't even taste it, you know, because I, I can't. You have to be able to identify what are the weeds and the thorns and the brambles and the thistles, you know, all the analogy we use. Because if we don't know what they are, we may just let them keep growing there. I remember one time I was in my backyard and there was this little thing that was about this tall. And I said, oh, that's probably a tree or something. I just let it, let, it, uh, let it stay there. You know, I could have pulled it right out. And I think a summer went by, you know. Uh, and I, I forgot to go back out to it. You know, I watched football games and did all the things they did summer. And I went out there, and the darn thing was a monstrous tree. It was about that thick. I said, how did that get so big? And I tried to pull it out, and I couldn't pull it out. Because I just let it, let it stay there, you know, for a little too long. And I had to get a saw. <laughs> and I was thinking as I was sawing it, I said, I could have just pulled this out three or four months ago. It's amazing. Growth in soil is amazing. But so we need to be able to identify uh, what they are. Another principle of soil, I just wrote these down, I, you know, you could probably find more, is that soil is not good or bad because it has weeds or good things. If it has a rose or it has weeds, the soil is not good or bad. It's just... It's just neutral. It will give growth to anything. And sometimes when we have bad things or evil things in our hearts or we see other people have them, we think that they are bad or evil. But the soil, soil is not bad or evil. It's just what's in there. You pull it out and it's gone away. It's a very important principle because it eliminates the concept of guilt and it gives you a mechanism by which you can choose. You don't say, I'm bad. You say, I got, I got a weed in my heart. Okay. <laughs> Another principle of soil that I found was that soil sometimes and usually periodically requires plowing. It needs to be plowed. And as you know what plowing is, is that you completely turn the whole, all of it over. And over and over again, Abdu Baha referred to tests and difficulties as plowing of the heart. This was his analogy for tests and difficulties. I'll read one of them. He says here, The mind and the spirit of man advance when he is tried by suffering. The more the ground is plowed, the better the seed will grow. The better the harvest will be. Just as the plow furrows the earth deeply, purifying it of weeds and thistles, so suffering and tribulation free man from the petty affairs of this worldly life until he arrives at a state of complete detachment. Plowing of the heart. Here's another statement. Uh, he says, The evolution of the spirit takes place through plowing up the soil of the heart, so that it is a constant reflection of the Holy Spirit. And Adabaha talks about holy souls. That's what he says about holy souls. Holy souls are like soil which has been plowed and tilled with much earnest labor, the thorns and thistles cast aside and all weeds uprooted. So you see this, there's several quotations there. Adabaha talks about how tests and difficulties are like plowing. As if anyone's ever had their heart plowed. How many of you had your heart plowed? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone should raise their hand. And if you haven't had it, it's going to be plowed. It's going to be plowed. And when it is plowed, think of it in these terms. 
that sometimes you need to completely turn that soil over. So let's now turn our attention to this very important principle of what are the weeds? What are the plants and the trees that we don't want in our heart? Because if we only want to plant certain things in our heart, what are some of the weeds? So I, I went into the, uh, the high writings and I, I typed various search things, get this out of your heart. Don't have this in your heart. What is this? Okay. And I found some of the things which I can identify as the weeds of the heart. These are the things you need to pull out as quick as you can, because if you don't pull them out, they're going to be plowed out, and you don't want them plowed. You want to see if you can pull them. The first thing I find that is a weed of the heart is what Baha'u'llah describes as worldly desires and cravings. Worldly desires and cravings. And I got this from the statement in the Persian Hidden Words, Approach me not with lifeless hearts, defiled with worldly desires and cravings. The next quote also supports this. He talks about vain and inordinate affections. It's pretty much the same thing, would you agree? Vain. And he says, in Gleanings, he says that we should eliminate the thorns and brambles. Thorns and brambles are like weeds, aren't they? Eliminate the thorns and brambles of vain and inordinate affections. Okay, that's a weed. Another weed is the attachment to material wealth. And we find this time and time again as something we need to pull from our heart. The attachment to material wealth, to money, and so forth. And as you know, in the Baha'i writings, attachment to material wealth comes in two flavors. The two flavors are, if you're wealthy or possess it, that you're proud of it or enjoy it. And the other flavor is that you don't have it and you want it. And they're both equally materialistic. He says, you know, he says, should prosperity befall thee? Rejoice not, and should abasement come on thee also, don't be sorrow. He says, if poverty overtake thee, be not sad. In other words, if you don't possess wealth and you crave it, that's equally materialistic to you possess it and, you, and so on. There's two sides of it. So we're all equally prone to this attachment to material wealth, whether we have it or we do not have it. The next weed of the heart is what Baha'u'llah defines as idle fancies and vain imaginations. And this is, how many times does this come up in the writings? I should have checked that one. Do you think it's a lot? Do you think it's in the hundreds? I, I, I think I'm going to do a count on that. Idle fancies and vain imaginations, in my understanding, are all the concepts in the world that we just blindly accept. Sometimes he calls it an imitation. We just accept it as being true. We absorb it by osmosis. You know, material things will bring you happiness. It's an idle fancy and a vain imagination. Gaining advantage over other people, that's a good thing. Your own race is better. Your own religion is better. This is true. That is true. And so on. How many things do we just blindly accept? These are idle fancies and vain imaginations. We need to just throw them away like throwing a suitcase off a train. Just Every day you should throw one suitcase off the train. And every day, you go, oh, there's another suitcase. Throw it off the train. The train's going to go, and that suitcase is gone. These are idle fancies and vain imaginations. In fact, Baha'u'llah says we should empty ourselves of all learning. Empty ourselves of everything. That's a weed of the heart. Another weed of the heart, according to Baha'i teachings, is envy. Envy and or jealousy, which I, 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 comp I relate those two to one thing. Envy and jealousy. And I get this from the Persian hidden words in which Baha'u'llah says, Know verily the heart wherein the least remnant of envy yet lingers shall never attain my everlasting dominion, nor inhale the sweet savors of holiness breathing from my kingdom of sanctity. So envy is one of those weeds that you've got to pull every last bit of it. Okay, there's an envy weed. Man, I better get every last bit of that because he says the least remnant of of envy, if a heart has even the least remnant of envy, shall never attain my everlasting dominion. Also, I find many other related themes to be compared to weeds of the heart. Any kind of ill feeling towards anybody or any person is a weed in the heart. You need to pull that from, from your heart. And I get this from this quote. It says, we need to clear the field of existence from the thorns and brambles of hostilities and ill feelings. Once again, hostilities and ill feelings are compared to thorns and brambles. How many times are bad things 
called thorns or brambles or weeds in the writings. Another weed of the heart is discontentment. Isn't this interesting? Discontentment is a weed. And what discontentment does mean is that we do not like what God has ordained for us. We want something else. That's what that's what's mean by discontentment. Baha'u'llah says the source of all good is trust in God, submission unto his command, and contentment with his holy will and pleasure. How many of us are discontent with our lot in life? And that's a weed we must pull. We must, must get rid of that. Shoghi Fendi says in this regard, we often feel that our happiness lies in a certain direction. And yet if we have to pay too heavy a price for it in the end, we may discover that we have not really purchased either freedom or happiness, but some new situation of frustration and disillusion. So discontentment is a weed you must pull. The long obligatory prayer, how many statements are that they say, oh, you know, you say to God, I wish only what thou wishest. That is pulling the weed of discontentment from your heart. Another weed that I find in the Baha'i writings, and you, you may not like this right now, and it's particularly timely to mention it, it's the weed of politics. We must pull politics from our heart. We have a principle in the Baha'i faith called the non-involvement in politics. But many Baha'is do not understand the principle. They think that the principle of the non-involvement in politics means that we don't join parties, we don't wear badges or have stickers, and we don't outwardly do it. But that is not what Shoghi Pendi said the meaning of non-involvement in politics was. He says, and I'm reading from Shoghi Pendi, we should, every one of us, remain aloof in heart and in mind, in words and in deeds, from the political affairs and disputes of the nations. Non-involvement of politics means your heart shouldn't be involved and your mind shouldn't be involved. Shoghi Fendi continues, we should keep ourselves away from such thoughts. Keep ourselves away from such thoughts. Did he say keep ourselves away from such actions? Non-involvement in politics means non-heart involvement in politics, non-thought involvement in politics. You know, we're living in a time now, every four years we have this ritual here in America, you know, where we have elections. And the whole world gets caught up in it. And it happens in every other country that I've lived in. Uh, they get caught up in it. It's just always the same. It's always the same, over and over again. One party says, do this, and you think that, and one party says, do this, and you think to do that. And all they're really doing is asking you to change deck chairs on the Titanic. That's all, that's all they're doing. There isn't, there isn't any difference. There's, I like to think of it this way. All, all politicians could, could say the same thing. They could stand up and say, the other party has been robbing you for years. Now give us a chance. And that's really, that's really all it is. And, you know, if you think that either party is a little closer to the Baha'i faith and therefore we should put our heart in it, just think again. There, there, there isn't either party in any election that's remotely closer in reality. It would be like where Baha'u'llah is going is the galaxy out there. And we've got two uh, rocket ships, and one's on a 30-foot platform, and one's on a 50-foot platform. Maybe one is a little closer, but it's insignificant. Just tell yourself, any time your heart gets dragged into politics and your thoughts get dragged into politics, just tell yourself over and again that Baha'u'llah said, this order is lamentably defective. Every time you see it on TV, just say, lamentably defective. And then say to yourself, Baha'u'llah said, soon, will the present day order be rolled up? Why mess around with something that's gonna be rolled up? How many of you ever stay in hotels and before you leave the hotel room, you make your bed? <laughs> no, you don't. If you do, why bother? You know that the maid is just gonna come in and clean it and make the bed. So you don't, make, you don't mess with a bed that's gonna be rolled up. Just leave it there. Baha'u'llah says, soon will the present day order be rolled up. Just leave it alone. It's gonna be rolled up. And I tell you the reason that we need to do this and keep it in our thoughts is that if we dwell on politics, if we follow it, we think about it, we talk about it, then many of the characteristics, confrontation, adversarial relationships, character destruction, you know, all the things, we absorb them into our heart. They become like weeds and grow there. And then they manifest in our Baha'i communities and our activities. You can't tell me 
that Baha'is do not have a reflection of some of these things of politics in our own Baha'i lives. You can't say we're totally free. It's, it's impossible. But the best thing we can do is follow Shoghi Effendi's advice and to be free in heart and mind from politics. Now, in all cases, weeds of the heart, we have two choices. We can either pull them out or we can wait to get them plowed. We can wait to get them plowed. And it's your choice. I don't have much time. What is it? I only have a couple minutes. So I'm not going to be able to finish what I did today, what I prepared. But, you know, I'll mention a few things. What I find in the Baha'i writings is that what goes on in your heart, the soil of your heart, is more real than what happens in the real world. This stems from the two principles that physical reality doesn't exist. Okay, if physical reality doesn't exist and the real world is the spiritual world, then what goes on in the spiritual world within your heart is just as real or even more real. And it is only a materialistic view that thinks that what happens in the physical world matters and what happens in the internal world doesn't matter. That's a materialistic concept. And consequently, anything that takes place in the heart is actually taking place. And we should think about it very carefully because the materialistic view says if something does no harm in thoughts and in intellect, then it's fine. If it does no harm in the physical world, it's fine. You know, as long as it's not acted out in the physical world, whatever goes on in the intellect or the, or, or the mind is fine. What's not doing a harm? What's wrong with it? So they see no problem in you know, pornography, violence in the arts, the media, and so on. And then they get so upset when they find that people act out in, in the real world what goes on there. That is because of this thing. You planted a seed in there, it grew, it got to a certain size, and it acted out. Whatever is in the heart will ultimately be acted out in the physical world. But the true reality is in the heart. We know this even from Christianity. Christ said, and uh, this is in uh, Matthew 5.28, he says, You have heard that it was said by the time of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman in lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. In other words, it's the thought that counts. In other words, you already committed adultery in your heart. Every, and this is a Christian concept. This is a very old idea. That reality is what goes on in the heart and mind, not what goes on in the physical world. And so this is a very important principle. If you want to eliminate any bad trait, do not try and curb the physical expression of that trait. Try to eliminate it from your heart, and then the physical expression will disappear. If you want to stop backbiting, don't keep trying to stop backbiting. You'll just keep doing it. But if you try in your heart to have no ill feelings towards people, no bad feelings towards people in your heart, then backbiting will not be an issue in the physical realm. And this is true of every negative trait. The heart has primacy. Baha'u'llah only wants your heart. That's all he wants. So I'm going to conclude now because I missed three or four points that, that I would have said, but it's okay. There's plenty of time to go over this in the future. My understanding is that by looking at spiritual principles, we can learn more about them by looking at the analogies that Baha'u'llah and Adi Baha use and then studying the scientific principles there and then relating them. And we gain insight. Today we've gained insight just a little bit into only two spiritual principles, the principle of unity and the purification of the human heart. I wrote down and did study, and I found some 30 or 40 different principles and analogies that we could look at. And if we had a whole course, and this is, this is something that any of us can do. It's very, very easy to do. And it occurred to me that science and religion then have a very, very wonderful relationship because science can help us to understand these spiritual things. And the advancement of science makes the manifestation of God more capable of expressing deeper spiritual truths. In the past, manifestations of God taught mainly by parable and allegory. They taught by parable and allegory primarily, and a little bit of direct symbol. What I mean by direct symbol is you just say unity is like a light, or they, you know, this is like soil and so on. 
But in order to use direct analogy, it requires the recipient to understand science and the principles of that. So in earlier times, the manifestation of God, he only had a limited amount of direct symbol that he could use because we didn't know so much. So the manifestation of God taught more with parable and, and allegory, which are stories extended that explain things. If you look in Baha'u'llah's writings, you see there is parable and allegory, but a lot more direct symbol. Isn't that interesting? It's like the evolution of religion. Because science gives the manifestation of God a greater and richer language by which to communicate spiritual principles. And so we can spend a lifetime of spiritual understanding and insight by relating scientific principles to religion. And fortunately, the manifestation of God has already mapped these things. He said, unity is like a light. The heart is like soil and so forth. And I hope in the future we can explore many more of these concepts and gain much more insight because in reality, the harmony of science and religion is not just that science needs to become more religious, but it's also that our religion needs to become more scientific. Thank you very much.